What a treat it's been today to have the Judson University Choir with us. We feel blessed, and I'm coming back tonight, and I hope you will too. One of the places they're going this week is Farmville, Virginia. Is that right? Farmville is very dear to me because my very first church when I was 19 years old was in Farmville. Do you know where you're going? Warren? What, what church in Farmville are you singing at? Okay, that's not where I was, but, <laughs> but Farmville's a picturesque place, a wonderful place, and my wife was a student at Longwood University, and that's where we met, and uh, it's a great town. While you're there, stop by Merck's restaurant and get some chicken salad, authentic Virginia chicken salad. You'll be glad that you did, okay? <laughs> We have been talking for several weeks about that little expression. You've all heard it. You've all said it probably. Have a blessed day. You said it when you paid for a bill at Starbucks or one of the uh, folks behind the counter said it to you. Have a blessed day. Now, it might just have meant have a good day, just as simple as that. But it ought to mean something more. So we've been spending some time talking about the blessed day and the blessed life. And we've looked at the Beatitudes of Jesus from the great Sermon on the Mount. And uh, he gives us eight or nine different sentences with blessed in it. And they're not describing eight or nine different kinds of people, but one in the same. It's the progression we go through in our Christian experience. So we start out poor in spirit. We realize our spiritual poverty. Then we mourn. We repent of our sin. We grieve over it. We are meek. We commit all that we are to Christ. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. We extend mercy to others just as it was extended to us. We try to be peacemakers in the world. And then we come to this last one today, and you really can't skip over it. It's part of it. It's where all the rest of them go. So we're in chapter 5. Would you turn to Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 3. Chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called, they'll be known as the children of God. And now the one for today. Blessed are those who are persecuted, Because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All of these are counterintuitive, but this more than any of them. Verse 11, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is God's word for us this day. Sometimes people ask me, uh, Pastor, do you ever get nervous when you stand in front of people to talk? Does it ever bother you? And the honest answer is no. I've been doing it, like I said, since I was 19, started preaching at 16. So it's all I've ever done, really, as an adult in my life. So no, I'm not nervous. But there are two times when I have a hard time with it, a difficult experience with it. One is when I'm talking to missionaries and their families. When we go on mission trips, there'll often be a worship service with just the the mission staff. And they ask me to preach since I'm the pastor, and uh, I can barely get through it. I begin to weep and cry when I realize who's sitting in front of me and what right do I have to talk to them about sacrifice and commitment and all the rest. But I, I go on through it. The other time is when I deal with a subject like this persecution. What in the world do I know about persecution? Well, some would say we don't even need to talk about this one because we don't experience that. There isn't any persecution today. That was long ago. That was in the early days of Christianity. That was Nero and all the rest. I'm here to tell you today, persecution still goes on in the world. 
Millions of people at this very hour are being persecuted severely for their faith. And I'm not uh, able to tell you that would never be your experience. Jesus is telling us we should be prepared to suffer persecution for the sake of Christ. Because in one form or another, this kind of persecution is inevitable. Jesus doesn't say, blessed are you if you are persecuted. Verse 11, blessed are you when you are persecuted. It's not if, it's when. It's going to happen. And Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3, 12, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, you want to live a godly life. You, you want to count for Jesus. Well, included in the equation is persecution. Now, maybe you didn't recognize it or you wouldn't call it that in the light of what some folks are going through, but persecution takes many forms. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus is delivering a sermon very like this one. This is the Sermon on the Mount. That one's called the Sermon on the Plain. And many scholars believe it's the same sermon, same day. Just a different account of it. And that may be true, but I think it's two different sermons. One on a mountain, the other down on level ground. But Jesus is the preacher, and he's using the same material. It's shorter in Luke 6, and he fashions it a little differently, but he's making the same point. You know, preachers do repeat themselves from time to time. One of our deacons surprised me not long ago and said, Pastor, I've started going back to day one of your ministry, and that goes all the way back to 2005, and everything's recorded. I've started listening every day to one of your sermons. That's my devotional time. And I was flattered until I thought about that. <laughs> if he's listening to everything I've said here, then somewhere along the way, he's hitting some repeats. So now I've got to change the titles around a little bit and move some of the points. I don't do it much, but sometimes I do repeat myself. And if the point is important, certainly so. But in Luke chapter 6... This sermon on the plain in verse 22. There Jesus says, blessed are you when people hate you, exclude you, and insult you, and reject your name as evil. Now that's a whole gamut of things. Your persecution could be ridicule, an insult. Starts out kind of humorously. They, they have a little joke. They jab you a little bit. It's not too serious. Nobody gets hurt. But maybe you do get hurt by what they say as it goes down into your heart. Ridicule and insult. Now, why do they do that? Why does the culture, why does, why does uh, secular entertainment have such a good time making fun of Christians? Well, some of it we bring on ourselves. And let's not, uh, let's not forget that. Sometimes we do things to bring it on. But they do seem to enjoy speaking against us. Why is that? It says in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are you when you are persecuted because of righteousness. It may be that your life is a rebuke. You didn't say anything about it, but your life silently lived before them is a rebuke of the way they're living. You're trying to be pure. You're trying to be chaste, pure in heart and pure in body. That's the Christian standard, but the world doesn't accept that anymore. The world is talking about me too and sexual assault and we should do that too. There's no place for sexual assault and, and uh, sexual activity where both parties are not in agreement about it. There cannot be any assault of children. We've got to draw the line. There's got to be a sense of right and wrong and the world is, is getting that. But the Bible goes further than that. We agree with that part of it. Human trafficking, human slavery is evil. But we've got to go further. The Bible talks about purity of heart. That sex outside of marriage is wrong. Before you're married and with somebody else while you're married. That's God's standard. And it hasn't changed. Well, you're trying to live that way. And maybe you fail. You try again. Maybe you're having a difficult time with it. But that's the standard. 
And people around you have long given that up. And you are a rebuke of their lifestyle. You're trying to be temperate. I'm not talking about a glass of wine for dinner, but I'm talking about folks that feel like they can't go to a party unless they drink and drink and drink until they can't remember where they are. And you used to do that, but you don't do it anymore because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so they are rebuked by, they don't invite you to go with them to the bar anymore because you're not going to participate. You're trying to live a simple life because Jesus told us to live that way. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. It's in this very sermon. And yet in our culture, it's all about accumulation and luxury and having the very best of everything no matter what it costs. And your life is a silent rebuke. The world says, get in there and get rough with people. Shake it up. Climb your way no matter the cost. But Jesus said, no, be peacemakers. Live humbly in front of others. Your life is a rebuke of that, and so they make fun. Persecution could mean you're excluded. Excluded from the invitation list. Excluded from the job. You don't get the promotion because you just don't fit in with the corporate culture. It could go to active hostility. Now it's really mean. Now folks are trying to hurt you in some way. It could happen. Talk to somebody sometime about their career, their experience, and maybe somewhere along the way it happened to them. Well, it's a whole gamut of things, but it ends up with martyrdom. Do you know that the Greek word for martyr is the Greek word for witness? Because you see, in the early days of the church, they were pretty much the same thing. If you were one who would stand and give testimony, if you were one who would share your faith, that was a death sentence. Martyrdom. And it's still happening in our world. People are still being tortured for their faith. Last August, several of us from the church were on a mission trip in Central Asia and folks from a closed country were coming across the border and we spent a week with them and, and taught them everything we could in, in a week's time and then we sent them back into that very closed culture. And just coming out, just being with us for a week, it didn't cost us anything. I mean, we weren't risking much of anything, but they were risking their lives. One night, a mother and her daughter asked to see me and we sat with Audrey and we talked and they told us about the girl's experience as a teenager. She was no longer a teen, now a young adult. But she told me that when she was 17, as a Christian, she was telling people about Jesus. She was being a witness, as the Bible tells us to. And for that crime, she was arrested. And she was thrown in prison, the worst prison in that country. An all-male prison. And she's a beautiful 17-year-old girl. And she spent some time in there. When it came time for her trial, they bring her out and she's standing before the moolah. And she looks around the room and there are some of her friends who are also Christian, who'd also been sharing their faith. And the moolah was demanding that they all recant, that they all take it back. And every one of them did. And they even turned on this girl, testified against her. But when it came her turn, she said, like Martin Luther, here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. She refused to recant. The moolah was perplexed. He was disappointed. He kind of slumped in his seat. And he said, you should not believe what you believe. But I'm convinced that you do. These others, they're not Christian. And they're not Muslim either, but you are a real Christian. And though I disagree vehemently with you, I'm going to give you a light sentence. And soon she was out telling people about Jesus again. It's happening in our world. And sometimes it leads to martyrdom, like with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German Lutheran. Arrested by the Nazis, sent to prison. And in 1945, days before the end of the war, the war's end was imminent and everybody knew it. 
He was sentenced to die, and they walked him out to the gallows. And they say as he climbed the steps, he said, This is the end, but for me it is the beginning of life. And those who witnessed it said his face glowed, and nobody they had ever seen died with such peace, trusting in God to take care of him. It happens in our world. Have you heard the expression, crossing the Rubicon? Crossing the Rubicon. It means that you've, you've gone past the point of no return. It comes from history. January, A.D. 49, Julius Caesar, commanding Legion 13, was north of Italy, and he was coming back toward Rome. The Roman Senate had said, you cannot bring an army in, but he disobeyed. He crossed the Rubicon River into Italy, and that was believed to be an act of insurrection and treason. And war broke out in Italy. He ended up, of course, being the great Caesar. But he, he went too far. He said in that moment, the die is cast. There's no turning back. I'm on my way. Now, when you have an experience in your life, in your career, whatever, where you, you take a step and there's no going back from it. Once you cross, you're there. That's crossing the Rubicon. Something like that happens when somebody gets baptized. You saw that gentleman get baptized this morning. I baptized two other adults in the, in the first service. Well, in, in this past summer, that same experience where I was, it was my privilege to baptize new believers and talk about the die being cast. Talk about the point of no return. They knew that when they got baptized publicly, that was it. When people, the authorities found out about it, they were as good as dead. And we stood in a chilly pool of water and I baptized them, just like the gentleman this morning. They knew what it meant, and I knew what it meant. It was an awesome moment. Now, it doesn't mean that in our culture. I mean, you applauded when that man was baptized today. That's what we do around here. But the meaning is still the same. You're crossing the Rubicon. There's no walking it back. You're committed lock, stock, and barrel to Jesus. So persecution is inevitable, and it takes many forms. But now, don't take it personally. Don't take it so personally. It's happening to you because of Jesus. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. It's not you. It's because of Jesus, and you're following Jesus. Turn to John chapter 15. John 15, verse 18. Jesus said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Remember what I told you? A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they'll obey yours too. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. It's because of Jesus. Now, sometimes today when we suffer ridicule or we're the, the butt of a joke about Christianity, we are quick to say, well, it's because I'm a Christian. I'm being persecuted because I'm a Christian. Not always. It might be because of your own idiosyncrasies. It might be that you're just a little odd, that's all. It might be that you're tactless. You don't know how to talk to people in a winsome way. You're overbearing, any number of things. Maybe it's the way you live and they know it. Sometimes it's us. But sometimes it's because of Jesus. And when we suffer because of Jesus, we understand that it's because of him, not us. So you and I, when persecution comes, we need to know how to face it. Face it. 
Viktor Frankl said the, the last great human freedom we have is to choose our response to any given situation. You do have the freedom to do that. You can decide ahead of time how you're going to handle it when it comes. And attitude is so much of it. So first of all, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when it comes. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening. Oh, why is this happening to me? As if you're the only one that ever suffered. Don't consider it strange. Don't be surprised. I'll tell you something that might surprise you, though. In the Sermon on the Plain, back in Luke 6, Jesus says something we don't find recorded in Matthew 5. In chapter 6, verse 26, Jesus says, Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. Ah, have you thought about that? When you're a jolly good fellow and you don't offend anybody, are you really walking with Christ? Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. Well, if nobody hates you, if everybody loves you, maybe something's wrong. Don't be surprised. What you're supposed to do is rejoice. 1 Peter 4 verse 13 says, But rejoice in so much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Rejoice. Celebrate. Talk about uh, going against the grain, counterintuitive. Absolutely. Rejoicing in suffering. Well, that's what the apostles did. In Acts chapter 5, Peter's one of them. They're hauled before the Sanhedrin and roughed up a little bit by them and warned not to do that anymore. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for his name. They knew what Jesus went through. And now they're rejoicing that they got to do it too. Just as he suffered, they are now invited in to participate in that same suffering. They rejoice. Did y'all watch the Academy Awards this last Sunday night? I watched because my son's old college roommate was up for an Oscar, and I wanted to see him win. He didn't win, but I, I wanted to see him win. But I, I sat through the whole program, and I was amazed when the winners would come up and they'd make their speeches. And some of them, it, they acted like they, it never occurred to them that they would win. And they just kind of fumbled around, and others had scribbled notes, and they couldn't read them. It, it was awkward. But they were given the statue, and they took it home. And I'm sure that many of them put it on the mantle in their home, or they put it in a trophy case. Well, the Bible says one day at judgment, there are going to be crowns for those who've been faithful, those who have served the Lord. And, and I, I want one. I, you want one, too. And, and maybe we'll get them. What are you going to do with the crown when you're given a crown by Jesus? Well, if you make a speech, thank those who helped you grow in your faith, who discipled you along the way. But if you get one of those crowns, you're not going to put it on the mantelpiece. You're not going to wear it around heaven. First chance you get, you're going to take it off your head and lay it at the feet of Jesus, who gave you eternal life. Because in that day, we're going to see him as he is. If he were to walk in here right now today and ascend the steps and, and come to this platform, we would see that the camera would zoom in on it and you'd see the nail prints in his hands and feet and the, the jagged brow and we'd all be overwhelmed. I'd have to get off the stage. I, I couldn't stand up here with him because I would see what he did. We can rejoice because... Because we participate with him in what he did for us. We can rejoice because of heaven. I reckon that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared with the glory. You can't even talk about them in the same sentence. With the glory which shall be revealed in us. Something else to do when persecution comes, mild or severe, use it as an opportunity to share your faith, 
to share the gospel. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes on to say, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Remember when Paul and Silas were arrested for sharing their faith and they're thrown in the innermost prison in Philippi at midnight. They think they're going to die the next day, but at midnight they are singing hymns and praising God and all the other prisoners are hearing it. The jailer is listening too. And when the earthquake comes and the doors are all open, he expects they're all going to run, but they don't. And so the jailer rushes in and says to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? How can I have what you have? He saw their persecution and how they sang through it, and he wanted that same kind of faith. One more thing. When persecution comes, commit your destiny to the hands of God. Commit your destiny to the hands of God. First Peter four nineteen. So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Just keep on going and commit all that you are to him. Now, you've done that in a way when you gave your life to Jesus. You, you gave yourself to him. But we're talking about giving everything now, all to Jesus. I surrender. I surrender all. Put your destiny in his hands. That's what Jesus did on the cross. We, we read about it this past week as we were finishing up Matthew. Matthew doesn't have this sentence, but we get it from Luke's gospel. Jesus says he's dying just before he died. He cried into your hands, Father. I commit my spirit. You can say that. Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit, my body, my life, my destiny. When persecution comes, and it will come in some way to all of us, we need to be ready. Don't be shocked by it. Be ready for it. And in that darkest time that comes your way, give glory to God and share him with those around you. Would you pray, please, everyone? We're going to sing in a moment. I'm going to stand at the front of the room. And it's possible that today you want to cross the Rubicon in your life. You want to, you want to, you want to give yourself to Christ in a very public way. We need to baptize you, and we'll do it in weeks to come. Or maybe you've made the decision, but you've kept it private. You really can't do that. You need to let others know. Step out and come. Or if you want to join our church and serve God with us here at First Baptist, step out into the aisle, come to where I'm standing, and tell me that, and we'll gladly receive you. Father, speak to every heart now and give courage to respond. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.